Hey everybody, my name is Joe Piverunas. I'm the founder and managing editor at Nanalyze. We're a boutique media and research firm that covers disruptive technology investing for a broad audience of institutional and retail investors around the globe. Today we want to talk about the 10 biggest solar stocks in the world. And prior to getting into that, we want to talk a little bit about how we define the term biggest. So that's a bit of a clickbait title. We want to use the method that is typically used, which is market cap. So the size of a company as measured by shares times price. Now that's a moving target. So when we talk about the 10 biggest solar stocks, that list may change as time goes on. Now, in order to come up with such a list, you need to figure out which companies would be considered solar stocks and index providers will typically look at things like the percentage of revenue coming from solar components. So solar is a theme that's mature enough where there are plenty of pure play stocks. So the index providers don't have to get creative. Now, the next question is now that we know how to define biggest, why do we care about the 10 biggest solar stocks? Well, we may want to invest in solar and we don't, want to invest in solar just because it sounds good and it's a cleaner energy energy source. We believe in doing good while doing good. And we'll give you an example. So a company that we've been invested in for a while now, Next Era Energy, they're the biggest renewable energy firm in the world. And when you look at their 20 year return, that's a thousand percent. Now, is that good or bad? Well, that's where we need to have a benchmark. So what benchmark would we use? Well, since we cover technology stocks, we may be tempted to use the NASDAQ. And if we did, we'd see that Next Era Energy outperformed the NASDAQ uh, by a fair amount. But that's not correct. Next Era Energy is actually classified as a utility company. So when we look at the performance of this company, we need to use a index that is appropriate, in this case, we're using the Utilities Select Sector Spider Fund, which returned 152% over the same time frame. So by any measure, Next Era Energy has performed spectacularly over the years, thanks to renewable energy, mostly wind. Now, the price performance isn't the only story. In fact, it's a story we don't really care about much because we hold Next Era Energy as part of our dividend growth investing strategy. That's the only stock that has an overlap between our tech portfolio and our dividend growth portfolio. Next Era Energy managed to grow their dividend over the past 10 years by nearly 11% every year. So right now the stock returns about 2% yield. This is what it looks like when a 2% yield grows by nearly 11% over 10 years. In 10 years time, you go from having a yield of 2% to a yield of 5%. It's called yield on cost, the, the amount of yield that, getting, that you're getting from the money that you put into the investment. So Next Era Energy has performed spectacularly well, and that's why we would want to invest in renewable energy so that we can realize returns like this. Now, solar in the past has been rather problematic for investors, and we want to not look at the past and rather look forward. So the question we want to answer is, is solar growing? Well, we pulled this information from the International Energy Agency, and this shows the capacity growth in wind and solar for the time period of 2015 through 2020. Then it also shows for the next uh, five years what the additional capacity is expected to look like. So the new capacity they bring online, and you can see that solar is growing much faster than wind. And if you look at a bigger picture, this was taken from Solar Edge, their investor deck. This is a look at what solar is expected to reach by 2050, based on all the expert opinions. And by 2050, it's expected that solar will be 38% of all electricity generation, followed by wind at 20. Whereas there, as you can see, in 2019, there were a very small component, collectively less than 20% of global energy generation. So this is a thesis that seems to have a great deal of merit. Now, the 
thing that we want to think about next is what would a good solar stock look like? Well, first of all, international diversification probably bubbles to the top because different countries will have different rules and regulations and tax credits and subsidies for solar. So if you're operating in a single country, simply having a new president can result in disaster or it can go both ways and create a lot of volatility. Whilst if you're operating in multiple countries, then you diversify away some of that regulatory risk. Now, we, we have to think about China when we talk about international diversification, and we've put two numbers up here. The first is the percentage of installed capacity globally in solar that belongs to China. So they have 36% of all capacity, and they also produce 71% of all photovoltaic panels. So China has is a dominant country when it comes to solar. Now we have to be careful there because when we're looking at stocks, we don't hold Chinese stocks for reasons that we've covered in the past. Primarily that the way for foreign investors to access Chinese companies is through what they call variable interest entities. And these are extremely shady shell companies that operate in the Cayman Islands that regulatory authorities have warned investors about, yet investors seem to ignore these warnings and we believe that they're too risky. That's the first problem. The second is good luck trying to dissect the collateral that Chinese companies produce and trying to understand what it is they do. It's extremely difficult without knowing the language. And if they do translate it, it's largely, um, it doesn't add much value, we'll put it that way. So the third thing to consider is a company that doesn't just produce hardware or panels, but it has a holistic solution, uh, think software as a service. And then lastly, we want always want to invest in any niche that we're looking at, we want to invest in market leaders. So let's look at the top 10 solar stocks. What we've done here is we've pulled up a list of the holdings for the Invesco solar ETF. That happens to be the only solar ETF. And that ETF contains, you'll see on the left-hand side here, as of today, 10 companies. And we've highlighted the companies that it contains, which it also contained the last time we looked at the ETF back in September of 2020. So you can see there's some consistency over time and you would expect to see that. Now, when we start going through this list, what we want to do now that we know what the top 10 companies are today, is we wanna to try to filter these down to find out if there's anything compelling in there that we might want to invest in. So first of all, what we would do is remove the Chinese companies. So we'd be left with seven names. If we start at the bottom and work our way up, you have Encavis from Germany. They're a holding company, much similar um, to NextEra Energy that we'd mentioned earlier. And the same with Atlantica Sustainable Infrastructure, a UK firm that also has a portfolio of renewable energy projects. Again, similar to a stock that we're already holding. And then you have Henan Armstrong, a US firm that's actually a I believe it's a climate solutions REIT, a real estate investment trust. That isn't something that we would be interested in. It's kind of outside the scope of what we're looking at, which is more a pure play stock that gives us exposure to solar. So what we're left with when we filter out everything that doesn't make sense are four names. And these are familiar names to anybody that follows the solar industry. You have Sunrun, they operate the largest fleet of residential solar energy systems in the US. That's following their acquisition of Vivint, which we commented on before. The stock prices rose through the roof for whatever reason when that happened, and they've since floated back down to earth. More than 40% of their cumulative systems deployed are in the state of California. So that's some pretty, uh, let's say, concentrated regulatory risk around a particular state. Then we have First Solar. They're the only surviving domestic manufacturer of solar panels in the US. Uh, this country that accounts for about 84% of their net sales, they need to compete with China, who, as we said earlier, dominates solar manu panel manufacturing with 71% market share. Then there's Enphase. They provide residential and commercial solar plus storage solutions, 80% of revenues from the U.S. And lastly, SolarEdge, which a cursory look here seems to be the most attractive. They have power optimizer, solar in uh, inverter, monitoring systems, et cetera. 
and their revenues are quite well geographically diversified. You have 45% coming from Europe, 40% from the US, and around 15% from the rest of the world. So of these four names, we would probably scratch off two. Sunrun, as we mentioned, heavy exposure to US residential and the state of California. They have $6 billion in debt on their books following the acquisition of Vivint, and they're just one regulation change away from breaching a debt covenant. So Sunrun wouldn't be a firm that we would look at. And then you have First Solar, they are competing with China. And then as of now, they're doing better because China is having some spat with the United States and there's tariffs uh, that are being ascribed to imports and whatnot. Uh, there was an interesting letter on their website from the CEO who was being critical of somebody who was being critical of his firm, talking about how the um, let's say solar panel manufacturers in the US are being coddled and he was having none of that. The fact is that the majority of the revenues come from a single country and we don't find that to be very appealing. That leaves us with two companies, Solar Edge and Enphase. So in future articles, we're going to take a closer look at both of these firms. Now there's also an article we've published that will be in the description of this video that relates to uh, what we've talked about today. There's more detail in that, so you could take a look. And then lastly, what's not in that article uh, are a couple points to make here. So commodities have been going through the roof. So since the beginning of 2020, uh, photovoltaic grade polysilicon has quadrupled in price. Steel's increased by 50%, aluminum 80%, copper 60%. Freight fees have risen six times over. So with the rise of commodity prices, that's putting a kink on the growth of renewables. So the uh, premise here is that if commodity prices remain high through this year, that three years of cost reductions for solar and five years for wind would be erased. That's crazy. And the increased costs would require over $100 billion of additional investment to install the same amount of capacity, which is equivalent to increasing today's annual global investment in renewable power by about one third. So commodity prices going through the roof have not been very helpful for solar and wind. So we're gonna go ahead and leave it at that. Please, any questions that you have, put them in the comments section on this video. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'll be putting out more videos. As I said, we'll be looking closer at Solar Edge and Enphase. We also cover other interesting topics such as synthetic biology, space stocks, and the like. So make sure to subscribe. Thank you very much for your time.